What's up, church? How we doing, everybody? We good? Man, it's so good to see everybody. I want to take a minute. I want to welcome everybody who's watching right now online. And of course, everybody who's over at that South Side, South Campus, South Campus. We love you. We love you there. We love you here. And the best way that we can show you is by clapping for you. So come on, will you clap for somebody sitting next to you? Just welcome them to church. Well, as was announced, I want to make sure and invite everybody to our first Wednesday in June. It is going to be so exciting. It's good to have um, uh, everybody back together in person again. We're going to be praying. We're going to be spending time in the presence of God. I want to encourage you to come out for it. And some of the things that we're going to be praying about specifically are uh, our new opportunities that we have with our new facility. All right. So I don't know if you guys know this, but we have a new facility that we're going to be get, we're going to be starting work on construction on in the next couple of months. And uh, we're going to unveil more details about that at first Wednesday. And uh, then we're going to be praying about it because God, we really believe this is a blessing from God. And uh, but we want to pray that God leads every aspect of it. So please be praying with us and come out and experience that. And thank you so much for uh, your prayers for it. And for those of you who have already started giving to our giving campaign that we haven't even started yet, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, but we'll, we'll you'll be hearing more about that. But we are just so so excited about what God's doing. Uh, we really believe this. He is just getting started. He's just getting started. So God's got great things. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm so glad that you are here today, that you've joined us for this series, because we are starting a brand new series that I think could be really transformational for you. It's about wisdom. All right. We've called it Be Wise, because all of us need wisdom. And the reason we need wisdom is because there's a lot of decisions that all of us face each and every day, right? We've got decisions when you wake up, when you go to school, you go to work, you interact with people. There's decisions. Some decisions are easy, and some decisions are not so easy. They're a little bit complicated. Like some easy decisions, all right, let's just get this out of the way. Apple versus Android, easy decision, right? Like, come on, Apple fans, you know, it's just easy. It's the gospel of technology, okay? It's just it's Apple. Or McDonald's versus Panera. Obviously, -da 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 -da. we're loving it. We're loving it. Golden Arches. You know those fries? Salad, French fries, French fries. Um, or or if, like, if you are trying to be a little bit more conscious of what you're eating, uh, you're like maybe going to try a new diet trend. You know, you could, you could maybe think about doing vegan, which is just all vegetables all, or raw vegan, raw vegetables, or, or keto, which is all meat, right? And so I think Kansas City, we know which one wins there. <laughs> it's meat. Come on, somebody, you know. It's, uh, it's, some decisions are easy, but some decisions are not so easy. How to handle different situations sometimes can challenge us, and that's where wisdom comes in. Had a little bit of one of those situations a few weeks ago. Sat down to watch uh, a show with my three-year-old daughter, Eden, and she was like, Dad, let's watch a show. Dad, let's watch a show. I'm like, all right, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's go. And I'm, you know, she's on the couch right there. I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, here we go, Moana for the millionth time, you know, Frozen for the zillionth time, you know, or Aladdin. One of those three usually is where we end up. And so I'm like, all right, what do you want to watch? And I'm ready to watch. And she goes, Dad, I want to watch Iron Man. And so I'm like, let's go. <laughs> let's go. I don't even know where this came from. I don't know if she was watching her brothers watch it or whatever, but I'm like, this is going to be a great father-daughter relationship. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. Watching superhero movies, I'm in. I'm in. And so she's like, I'm starting to scroll through, and she's like, let's watch it. I'm like, okay, yeah, we're going to get there. She was, I want to watch Iron Man. He's so cute. <laughs> I said, you're three. <laughs> Moana it is. <laughs> you know, it's like... What am I supposed to do with that? You know, it's like, God help me. I mean, uh, you're, you're way too young to think Robert Downey Jr. is cute. <laughs> but life, life throws curveballs at us. Well, how do we handle situations? And there are situations we deal with all the time. Your business, your family, your coworkers, your kids. And a lot of times, they can seem to be multiple choice. Do you remember multiple choice questions? 
Like in school, some of you are still in school, so you're living that. But man, back, in the, like, back when you were in school, like it would be choose the best answer, like the worst, right? Like that's the worst question you could be asked because, because there's multiple right answers, right? But you need to choose what's best. So A was true, B was true, but C was more true. And you got to find the best answer. How many know a lot of times that's life? Life isn't, I like the true and false. I want, I want it to be right, wrong. You know, I, I want it to be clear. But a lot of times it's, uh, I'm not so sure. You can do this, but it may not be wise. Like for instance, like it's not wrong to swim with sharks with like a belt of kibasa tied around your waist. Like it's not wrong morally to do that, but it's also not wise to do that, right? It's not wise to do that. It's not, it's not wrong to eat Twinkies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of you might agree with me that would be glorious. That would be glorious. But is it wise every day? No, it's not wise. Is it wise or is it wrong to like binge your favorite show? all night long, every day, staying up late and not showing up to work. It's not, it's not morally wrong, but it's not wise. And so that's where Proverbs comes in, the book of Proverbs. It's an Old Testament book, and, it, and it's, it's wisdom. And because here's the thing, God wants us to live with wisdom. God wants you to live with wisdom. Let me give you a working definition of wisdom, all right? Wisdom is this. It's knowing what to do, how to do, when to do, and doing it. So if you're taking notes, write that down. And if you're not taking notes, write that down. Wisdom is this. It's knowing what to do, how to do, when to do, and then doing it. And so that's what I want to kind of unpack over the next several weeks as we are in this series called Be Wise. Now, there's a term called Monday morning quarterback. How many sports fans we have? North, South campus. Come on, just raise your hand. Sports fans, all right. I love sports. I love watching sports. I love watching the pre-commentary before the game, the mid-commentary during the game, post-commentary after the game, and then Monday morning commentary where people just dissect the game and break it down, right? Talk about, you know, I can't believe he made that throw. I can't believe he didn't see that defender floating over the top. How could he throw that interception? It's easy to criticize after the fact, right? Or have you ever been watching a game? Like you're in your house, you know, and you've, you've got your nachos in one hand and your Coca-Cola in the other. And you're like, oh, you're watching a professional athlete who is basically a machine of muscle. And you're criticizing and being like, oh, I can't believe he did that. Oh, man. I would have never done that. You know, have you ever been like that? You're like, oh, if I could just be, you know, it's like if I could be on the field, sure, you can see what's happening because you're in the comfort of your own home looking at 16 different camera angles in slow motion. You can see what they can't see because they're in the game. They're like in the middle of the game. What if you could have that Monday morning quarterback perspective while you're in the middle of the game? That's wisdom. That's wisdom. It's knowing what to do, when to do, how to do, and then doing it. I like, I like to think of it like the Matrix. Anybody remember the Matrix movie came out a long time ago? There's another one coming out this year, just a little, in case you didn't know, that's, a little, that's free. Okay. <laughs> Worth coming to church for that. Um, Matrix coming out. But one of the coolest things is 90s movie came out, and I love, I love technology. It's just so fun. And one of the things about Matrix was they, they had this new technology when the movie came out, and so they, like, it was slow motion, which it now is very common, but when this, it all started really with The Matrix, one of the first movies that did this. Slow motion, and so Neo, when he's getting shot at, you can see like the bullets coming, and like he slows down, and remember, this is the Matrix move, like this thing, you guys remember? Like every Matrix move was this, and then they're grabbing their gun, and throwing it up, and then spinning and then shooting all while they're doing like this like that's the matrix and 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 really really it was it was interesting because they were slowing up they were seeing things that were coming fast but they were seeing it and they were able to respond that's wisdom wisdom slows down the game of life 
and it allows you to see what's really happening and then respond appropriately with lethal force. Come on, somebody just had to get that in there. All right. And what, where wisdom is found is the book of Proverbs. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be spending some time looking at different aspects of wisdom as found in the book of Proverbs. And so we're going to be unpacking that. And today what I basically want to do is want to introduce this idea, introduce you to the writer of Proverbs, and, and hopefully begin a journey with wisdom. Now, Proverbs is written by this guy named Solomon, all right, king of Israel, the son of David, the first king, or the second king, actually, the best king is King David, and Solomon is his son. And Solomon has something that all of us wish we could have. It's God showing up to him saying, hey, if you could have anything, what would you want? Now think about this for a moment. Put yourself in that situation. If God asked you, what would you want if you could have anything, what would you ask for? Million bucks? A couple houses on each coast? Like what would, you, what would you ask for if you could have anything? What's interesting is Solomon asks for wisdom. It's really interesting. And I'm going to show you why he asked for it here in just a little bit. But he asked for wisdom and he gets it. So here's the cool thing about that whole situation is God gives him wisdom, more wisdom than anybody else has had on the face of the planet outside of Jesus Christ. He has more wisdom than anybody else, but God also gives him uh, favor and provision and money and riches and fame. In fact, people were so enamored with his wisdom that they would come from all over the world just to listen to him talk. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9, has a, has a report of the Queen of Sheba when she came and visited King Solomon. Look at this, 2 Chronicles 9 and 5. She says this, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true, but I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half the greatness of your wisdom was told me. You have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. She's saying, man, it must be so great just to listen to you all day long. Now, she's encouraging him, but I also think she's flirting with him. Did anybody else picking that up? <laughs> I'm thinking like Southern Belle, like, oh, my goodness, I do declare. <laughs> King Solomon, how happy your officials must be. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's clearly what's happening here. It's how I read it. You can pray for me. I've got some issues, obviously. But she's like, you, you've got wisdom, and he did have wisdom. He builds palaces and parks, and he builds the Jewish temple, which was known around the world. And everybody's like, wow, this is amazing. You did all of this. But what is so interesting about Solomon, he had all of this wisdom, and yet he goes against against it. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes. He walks us through all of the ways he went against it and how bad it went for him because of it. It's Ecclesiastes. And so what you get in Proverbs is Solomon writing to his son saying, listen, man, I've learned a lot. And here's what I want you to understand about life. There is a way that this works. And when you find it, it goes well for you. That's the book of Proverbs. And so we're going to unpack this. And I want to look at Proverbs chapter 3 because I think Proverbs 3 really summarizes what wisdom is in a significant way. We're going to pull some different Proverbs as we go throughout the message today. But Proverbs chapter 3 is going to show us five things about wisdom, all right? If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Wisdom is the way things work. Wisdom is worth getting. Wisdom is available. Wisdom is personal. And wisdom is only as good as it is applied. It's the way things work. It's worth getting. It's available. It's personal. And it's only as good as it is applied. I'm going to unpack those five things, see how that ties in with what Solomon's trying to communicate to us. And hopefully, we're all going to walk away a little bit more wise than when we came in. All right? So before we do, why don't you find 65 people next to you and say, hey, man, be wise. Just tell 65 people real quick, be wise, and then we will jump 
on in. First thing that I think Solomon is communicating is this. Wisdom is the way things work. It's the way things work. What Solomon tries to communicate is that there is a bigger idea of wisdom. It's actually part of the design of all things. And it comes from this word that we're going to see here in just a second, the beginning of Proverbs 3, called hakmah. All right? It's a fun word to say, hakmah. And the word just, it's the word for wisdom. And the idea behind hakmah is that it's, it's, the way things have been designed, that there is a design to life. You can see it in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19. By wisdom, or by hakmah, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. So see, walk, watch that. He laid the earth's foundations. As he's creating all things, there's hakmah, there's wisdom. It's like in the concrete, if you will. It's the ingredient of life. And he says, by understanding, he set the heavens in, in place. By knowledge, the watery depths were divided and clouds let drop the dew. The idea with Hakmah is that it's needle and thread. All right? It, it's needle and thread. So it's like the fabric of life. There's a fabric of life that when you find the fabric, you find, you find life. You find Hakmah. Now, growing up, there was this commercial for cotton. Uh, some of you might remember as cotton, like the touch, the feel the fabric of our lives. Do you guys remember this long time ago? You know, and I love me some cotton. Can I just get an amen? Like, cotton is amazing, clearly from the Lord. I like me some 500 thread count sheets, nothing better in the world, right? But you know, cotton really isn't the fabric of our life. Wisdom is the fabric of life. Wisdom is the fabric of life. It's literally the way God made everything. There's certain things that are just true, whether we believe them or not. Like, like gravity, for instance. Like you might say, like, I don't believe in gravity. I just, I just don't believe it. How many know gravity believes in you? <laughs> you know, it's like you may not believe it, but gravity believes in you. And if you're on this stage and you take a step off this stage, you will find yourself at the bottom of the stage on the floor. That's just the reality. There's a law to gravity. That's wisdom. There's a law to life. God has created a law to life. And there's a grain, if you will. So when you find the hakmah, when you find the grain of life, it goes well for you and it's easier. And when you go against the grain of life, it goes bad for you. If you're faithful, if you're honest, if you save, if you work hard, there th it just goes well for you. If you don't do those things, it goes bad for you. It's hakmah. It's the way things have been made from the very beginning. But it's more than information, and it's more than experience. Wisdom is deeper than all of those things. It's finding out how God has made this thing. It's the way things work. That's number one. I want to show you number two. Everybody say number two. Number two is this. Wisdom is worth getting. It's worth getting. In fact, Solomon makes this whole appeal all throughout Proverbs. You need to get this. And what he does is he contrasts the wise person with the fool. The fool is the person who goes against hakmah. The wise person is the person who finds hakmah and goes with it. And he says, man, be wise. It's worth getting. But here's the thing about Solomon. He didn't find this on his own. You know where he found this? He found this from his dad. He got this from his dad. Now, King David's known for two things, right? Really, primarily two things. Killing a giant and having an affair. It's really what he's, it's really what he's known for. And, and he learned a lot from that, a lot of pain from the second thing. And, and he's like, man, if I just would have gone with wisdom, it would have been different. And so what's interesting is, is in Proverbs chapter 4, Solomon records his dad telling him, get wisdom. And this shows him the importance for us as parents. If you're a parent out there. We need, to, we need to plead with our kids. Number one, we need to apply wisdom. And then we need to teach wisdom 
everywhere and every way we can to our kids. Look at what he does in Proverbs chapter 4. This is Solomon recording what his dad David told to him. He says, For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Everybody say, get it. Come on, everybody say, get it. He says, get it, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get it. He says, you want to know what? Just, he says, just get it. Just find it everywhere, every way you can and get it and apply it. He says, though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. See, that's why I believe when God asked Solomon as a young man, what do you want? He says, well, what I really want is money. What I really want is fame. What I really want is a lot of stuff. But my dad drilled this into me. I need wisdom. And I think that's why he asked for it. Because he understands there's nothing more valuable than wisdom. Why? Let's go back to Proverbs 3. Back to Proverbs 3. This is Solomon now. And he says, blessed are those who find wisdom. That word blessed, Baruch, is the word happy, pleasant, favored, graced. Who doesn't want that? All of us want that. That's the person who finds wisdom. They gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Now, today a lot of us would save money. We would invest in the stock market. We want to find a good return. We want to find a good return. If you're getting a bad return, usually get out of that investment. Like this is not working out. He says this. Wisdom is more valuable than the most precious thing on the planet. Let me just ask you for a second. Do you believe, do you believe that? Like, don't say yes. I just want to ask you, do you believe it? Because that's what Solomon is saying. Here's, now, here's what's interesting about Solomon. He's an authority on all things money because he was the richest person at that time in the world. And probably still, his money today would hold up against the richest people in the world. So you get the richest person on the planet saying, let me tell you this, wisdom is more important than money. Well, why is that? Because you can have a lot of money, and if you don't have wisdom, you can lose a lot of money. <laughs> or you can have a lot of talent. You can be really talented, and people want to see you sing and dance and perform. But if you let it go to your head, then it'll mess you up, and you'll find yourself all isolated from people, and people want to be around you. Or you can have a great work ethic. Say, I just work hard. And you can work yourself too hard and burn out and not be able to enjoy what you've worked for. See, you know what wisdom does? Wisdom helps you navigate all of that. That's the beauty of wisdom. That's why it's more valuable than anything on the planet. And look what it brings about, verse 16. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. So when you elevate wisdom... It goes well for you. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. When you walk in wisdom, in general, not always, this isn't every time, but in general, you're going to have peace because you're going to be thinking about what's really happening. You're going to be slowing down. You're not going to be responding in the flesh. You're going to be thinking about what's actually happening. You're going to think about the hakma. You think, well, what is God's way here? Is, and, and Proverbs is full of all of these little tips and tricks to navigate this stuff, all right? So, so then he says, uh, she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. It goes on to verse 18. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. He's like, it's like fine jewelry. You'd be looking good with some wisdom. That's what the Queen of Sheba was saying. She's like, Solomon, you looking fine. <laughs> you looking good. Here's the thing about wisdom. It keeps you looking good, and it keeps you from looking bad. Keeps you from looking bad. 
None of us want to look like a fool, right? Nobody's like, man, I just want to embarrass myself in front of everybody. We don't like that. We don't want that. Wisdom helps us avoid it. Look, verse 23 says this. Then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. That word stumble is the word nagaf. It means to strike, to do serious damage. And the idea is as you're walking in life, there can be a tendency to not pay attention to hakmah. And when you don't pay attention to hakmah, guess what happens? You stub your toe. Have you ever been on a hike and you're, you, you, you turn, you drop something, you miss it, and you hit this rock? You hit this rock with your toe and you have good hiking boots. You know, all of a sudden now you're, like, you're walking like this the rest of the way. People think you're trying to be cool and stuff, but you're like, no, I just really hurt my foot. And now here's the thing. When you stub your toe and you start walking like this, now guess what? All, everything else hurts. Your back hurts. Your arm hurts. The other leg hurts because everything's compensating for the pain that has caused on the left or on the right side. That's, that's what he's trying. He's like, hey, listen, when you walk with wisdom, you're going to see, oh, there's a rock there. Don't step on that. Oh, there's damage there. Don't step there. There's danger here. Don't go there. That's wisdom. Wisdom keeps us from stumbling and making a fool out of ourselves. Verse 24, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that overtakes the wicked. Here's the reality. When you live a foolish life, a self-centered life, a life that thinks that you know everything and that you're the center of your own world, or when you go against hakmah, you say, I know what's right, but man, I'm going to do this instead. Here's the reality. You know that you're not living right. You know that something's not right. And so you, you have this sudden fear of, man, I don't know if this is going to work out. I don't feel like God's with me. I don't. You have all of that anxiety, but that's not what God wants. He wants you to find hakmah. And then when you do, verse 26, the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. That word snared, very interesting, is the word lakata. It means captured. So it has this idea of a prisoner of war being captured or being like caught in a trap, like an animal caught in a trap. And what's interesting, Proverbs would have been taught to young people. This was a teaching tool. And so as Proverbs is being taught, it's being read. Number one, it's to David, or Solomon's son, but then it was distributed. It was, hey, everybody needs this. So they'd be reading this to these kids. And as these kids are hearing it, they're thinking Lakata. They're thinking animal caught in a trap. And they're thinking about the animals that they have seen caught in the traps. Now, I grew up in the city, all right? Detroit area, 313. I didn't get out very much. The concrete jungle, jungle, like I did not see animals caught in traps. I went hunting once in my life. Um, but, but these kids, they would have seen animals caught in traps all the time. And what a terrifying look is on the face of animals that are caught in traps. They know that their end is near and there's no escaping it. And that's what he's saying, listen, wisdom keeps you from getting caught and not being able to get out. He's like, man, it is so precious, it is so valuable, it is so helpful. Some of you are like, man, I wish I could get some. Well, the good news is, the next thought, wisdom is available, it's available. In fact, what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 1, he says, wisdom is actually looking for you. It's actually looking for you. Look at this. Wisdom cries aloud, verse 20, in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice at the head of the noisy streets. Pay attention to that. We'll come back to that in a second. She cries out at the entrance of the city gates. She raises her voice. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in scoffing and fools hate knowledge? It's like, how long will you continue to make that mistake that you've made over and over and over again? Why are you going against Hakmah? He says, she says this, wisdom is calling out and says, if you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you and I will make my words known to you. Here's the thing. Wisdom wants to be found 
Wisdom is calling out. God wants you to have wisdom. Well, how do we experience it? James, the brother of Jesus, tells us. James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Here's the thing about wisdom, though, and this is what Solomon tells us in Proverbs chapter 1, is that at the head of the noisy streets, wisdom's crying out. Do you know what he's saying there? He's saying there's a lot of noise out there that's working against wisdom. Isn't that true? I think maybe more true today than ever. We've got noise happening all every time we open our phone. Noise. Just noise. Noise, noise, noise. And it's, and, it's, and it's coming against. And so what we have to do, and we have to recognize what the noise is. And that's why Paul the Apostle says, Romans chapter 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world. I just want to, I just want to encourage you guys. There is a pattern of the world working against wisdom. And we have to be able to recognize and say, man, that's, that's not God. That's not the spirit of God. That's not the spirit of Jesus. That's not the spirit of truth. We say, Scott, well, how would I know? There's so much noise. That's why we got to be in the word. That's why we got to be in the word of God. If you want to be able to know what God thinks and what God says, you got to be in what God has communicated to us through his word. Be in the word so that the word will be in you. And you'll be able to say, no, nah, that's not wisdom. So there's noisy streets, but here's the thing. You know what wisdom looks like a lot of times? Proverbs 123, it looks like a rebuke. Like Proverbs 123, if you turn at my reproof. A lot of times when wisdom comes to us, it will look like correction. Now, how many of you, come on, both locations, you love being told that you're wrong? Come on, just raise your hand. You just love it. Okay, how many of you like telling someone else that they're wrong? Come on, just have a moment. Yeah, a little bit more of us. You're like, yeah, I got a few things to say. Pass the mic, Scott. <laughs> Wisdom looks like a rebuke. And here's the thing about this message. It's really funny because this, I had to apply it. I had to apply correction on this message this morning. We're, we had our pre-service huddle, and um, Nathan Teagarden uh, came up to me, and he's like, He's like, oh, yeah, hey, that one part that you were talking about, this and that, it didn't make much sense. And so I just thought you might want to know that. And everything inside of me said, shut up. <laughs> That's because you don't understand. <laughs> That's what my spirit said. What my mouth said was, okay, thank you. Thank you. I will think about this. And then as I thought about it, I was like, well, I think he's right. I think he's right. So I took it out. <laughs> it was in Thursday and it wasn't in this morning because I wanted to apply. I was like, man, if that's getting people tripped up, the last thing I want to do is be unclear. And that's exactly what wisdom is. It's being open to being wrong. And it's turning. And God is calling out to us, and he's saying, hey, listen, I want to help you. I want to help you make less mistakes. But in order to make less mistakes, you've got to be willing to be wrong and turn from it. What keeps us living like the fool, and this is what we see in Proverbs, what keeps us living like the fool is by insisting that we're right, by insisting that we can't ever be wrong in a situation. But the wise person responds to correction. All right? Well, what does wisdom look like? It looks personal. Wisdom is personal. It's found in others. It is found in getting counsel from people. And this, let me just say, this is why life group is so important. This is why church is so important. We've got to have people in our lives that can call us out on stuff and who we can get advice from. Proverbs 15 says, plans fail for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. Come on, just how many would admit this? How many of you have ever had an idea that you thought was really, really good, and, and some people weren't excited about it, and they made it better with advice that they gave you? Come on, just raise your hand. Like, they made your idea better. I mean, but you thought that thing was perfect. 
You ever had an idea where you're like, oh, this is gold. Oh, man. Whew. People, this is going to bless the world. I mean, look out, Steve Jobs. I mean, <laughs> this is going to be right up there. Like you, but you've got to get people weighing in on that. And as we're going to unpack in this series, you need people speaking truth to you. You've got to have that. So wisdom is personal. It's found in the counsel of the wise. But here's the thing. Ultimately, wisdom is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, may be the thesis not only of Proverbs, not only the Old Testament, but maybe the whole Bible, really. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. See, the key is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Finding God, finding wisdom starts with not trusting in yourself. You know, there's a popular philosophy of, oh, you just need to believe in yourself. You need to trust yourself. You need to trust your instincts. That's not biblical. And that can really mess you up. But when you trust in God, when you actually say, I'm not going to trust in myself, but I'm going to trust in God, that's the wise person. That's the person who's finding hakmah. The fool is the person who's 100% confident in all their decisions, who never responds to correction, who thinks they're always right. But the wise p- person listens and learns and receives instructions and surrounds himself with other wise people. But ultimately and primarily, The wise person is the person who has a relationship with God. Proverbs 9 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now that word fear is yaira, and it means awesome. So here's here's what he's saying. The person who says, God, you're awesome. That's the person who finds wisdom. The person who says, God, wow, I see you at work in all of this creation. All that I know is natural. It's not an accident. I am not an accident. I'm not here by accident. I'm not in this moment by accident. You have a divine plan and purpose for all of this. That is the person who begins walking in wisdom. And I want to ask you today, is that where you are? Have you had that moment? Are you living in that moment where you say, God, this whole thing is from you, it's about you, it's for you? Have you had that moment? Or are you still living for yourself? Because if you live for yourself, that's the fool who stumbles and trips and misses all of this person who says, you know what, there is a God, he's working, and I want to find what he's done in all of this. I want to find Hakma. I want to understand what he has and wants and plan- has planned out for me. I want to walk in that. That's wisdom. Again, wisdom is knowing what to do, how to do, when to do, and then doing it, which is the last thing. Wisdom is only as good as it is applied. Applied. You got to apply it. Jesus says, In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, this is after the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. It's not enough just to hear it. James, the brother of Jesus, will say this as well. Don't be hearers, but be doers. Apply the wisdom. And put them, it's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Here's what God wants for you. He wants you to be solid. He wants you to be strong. He wants you to be able to stand the storms and the winds of life in this world. And he wants you to be strong. Not perfect. You won't be perfect, but you can walk in wisdom. There is a way of wisdom. So here's what I want to do at the beginning of this series, all right? I want to challenge all of us to do three things. For the next 30 days, I want to ask you, to read wisdom every day. It's 31 Proverbs. You can start today, Proverbs chapter 1, and just read it. If you listen to it, you probably listen to a couple every day on your way to work, 
on the treadmill, just listen to it over and over again. Read wisdom every day. Let it get in you. Let that word of wisdom get in you. A proverb a day keeps the devil at bay. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Read wisdom every day. Then ask for wisdom every day. James says it's available. Solomon says it's looking for us. All we have to do is open our heart and say, God, help me see what you're doing. I don't know how many times a day I pray for wisdom. It's because I know how desperately I need it. God, give me wisdom in the situation. Man, there's so many challenging things. How do we deal with this? God, give me wisdom. And then third, invite wisdom into your heart. Invite wisdom into your heart. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then today can be a day that changes where you invite wisdom personified into your life. And you stop living for yourself and you say, I want to live according to the wisdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for the wisdom that you so graciously and generously give. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, we want to walk in wisdom. We want to have wisdom. So I pray that, God, you would help us to experience it. Each and every day, Lord, I pray you would help us to walk in it. Lord, as a church, I pray our church would be a wise church, a church that experiences all that you have for us because we live wise lives. Help us, God. With every head bowed and every head closed, I want to take a moment. I want to ask you the most important question that you will ever have to answer. It's the wisest thing you could ever do is by inviting wisdom into your heart. It's where wisdom starts. But it's not, it's not about learning a textbook. It's not about right and wrong answers. It's, it's not even about memorizing Proverbs. It's much more than that. It's a personal relationship with God because what God has done, he's created us to know him, to know him. But the reality is the sin of our lives, the sin of this world, the sin that we have committed, it keeps us from God. But God sends Jesus, wisdom personified, to live perfectly, then to die in our place for our sin, to take it upon him. And what's amazing is that by accepting that reality, by believing on Christ, by trusting in the Lord with all of our heart and leaning not on our own understanding, Wisdom takes place in a relationship with God is birthed. And so if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, this is a beautiful opportunity because God wants you to know him. Not as a religion. Not as rules, but as a relationship, a personal relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is say, God, I, yes, I believe. I'm willing to turn from myself, and I'm, I want to turn towards you. So if that's you today, and this is speaking right to you, and you know God's drawing you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to get right with him, maybe for the first time or for the first time in a long time. God is calling you. He wants you to come home. He loves you with an everlasting love. If God is speaking to you right here, right now, you can invite wisdom into your heart by saying yes, and God will change you. From the inside out. That's you. I want to pray for you. You're saying, Scott, this is speaking right to me. I, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe for the first time or for the first time in a long time, all across this place, the South Campus, just raise your hand right now and say, Scott, would you pray for me? Hands going up all across, across this place. Just say, yep, that's me. Hand, yep, I see it. I see it. Yeah, I just, I want to see every person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to pray for you, pray for you. Just reach out to God right now and say, Lord, I invite you in. God, I pray for every person who is in this place right now, God, they've, they've experienced life, they've experienced you and what you have, and they're saying yes. That God, you are the answer, you are the way, you are life, you are wisdom. And we just invite wisdom into our heart, Lord. We pray that we would walk in it, that we would experience it, and that, Lord, your will would be done, that your kingdom would come in our lives. Help us to experience it. Help us to walk in it. And God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We stand with me, church, both locations. I just want to take a moment and 
So many people raise their hand to that decision. That's the best decision. We're going to worship here in just a moment. I want to encourage you to pray, talk to God, give your life to the Lord right now. And for the rest of us, can we just take a moment and say, God, we recognize that you are awesome, that you are what this is all about, and we want to build our life on the rock. We want to build our life on wisdom. So help us to know what to do, when to do, how to do, and then to do it. Amen. Would you lift your hands all across this place at the South Campus? Father, we love you. And we say, God, be God to us. Be the thing that is the greatest thing by far above anything else, though we pray that your wisdom would be ours. Help us to base our lives on you, to apply it. And God, I pray that you would change us in this series. Over the next 30 days, God, we pray that we would be wiser, that we would walk with you, that we'd experience all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, let's worship.